If you have a copy of God's word today, I want to invite you to open it up to the book of Philippians. We're going to begin today in Philippians chapter 4. As you're turning there, let me tell you, I can remember there was a day in 2004 that seems like yesterday in my mind. It was a long day and I'd come home exhausted and my wife met me at the door and walked me up the stairs. And once we got upstairs, she hit play on a video and in that video she announced a huge announcement in the life of our family. The video said, congratulations, we're having a baby. We're pregnant. And from that moment on, my life was never the same. At first I was shocked, right? Like many of you were shocked, but very quickly that state of shock transitioned into a a state of excitement, a state of joy. We were so excited about this new chapter in our life that was about to begin. We were so excited, we started jumping around the room like a couple of kids fired up. I mean, we were hugging and high-fiving and jumping around and dancing. We couldn't wait to begin this new chapter as mom and dad. Well, we immediately started talking about how we were gonna break the news to our parents. Because if you know, if you have two sets of parents, you have to figure that out because if you tell one set before the other set, you get in trouble, civil war breaks out. And so you have to kind of be creative on how you're going to make this big announcement once and for all. So we planned a dinner. We had a new house and we thought we would use the new house as an opportunity to have a housewarming party where we invited both sets of parents to join together for the very first time, one of the few times since we had been married. And so it was a little bit tricky because Audra's family lived a thousand miles away and they had to fly, but, but very quickly we nailed down the date, the dinner date was set, and we had everything planned out. Audra and I went to uh, the store and we bought these fancy little decorative baby rattles. They're made of silver. They, they were beautiful and we thought, man, this would be a great way to break the news to them and it would also serve as a great commemorative item to remember the day they realized that they were going to be grandparents for the very first time. These little decorative rattles, you opened them up and inside you could put a picture and so the plan was to take the sonogram picture and to put it inside the rattle so that every time they looked at it, they would remember this was the moment when we figured out we were going to be grandparents. And so the plan was we would serve our parents dinner and instead of bringing them a plate full of food, we would bring them a plate with this baby rattle and in that moment we were going to make this grand announcement that we were pregnant. I'll never forget one particular night, just a couple of nights before the big dinner. We were laying in bed and Audra told me that she was experiencing some pain in her abdomen. And me being the sensitive 24-year-old that I was at the time, I said something like, you know, it's probably just gas, roll over, you'll be all right. You know, that's just... But in that moment, she said, no, I feel like this is serious enough for me to go to the doctor. You know, being a baby doctor would be a pretty great job most of the time. Being able to meet with families and, and talk to them about their babies and to be able to see the excitement and joy on their faces when they became moms and they, they became dads. But being this particular doctor was probably pretty rough that day because this was a man who had to look my wife in the face and say, I'm so sorry, but there is no heartbeat. That was a rough day in our our life. One of the toughest days we've ever endured. We cried like you would cry. We were asking God, why? Why would this happen? I mean, we went through that same season that many of us have walked through before where we just don't understand what God is doing. I mean, we had this huge dinner party planned, right? But now instead of telling them, hey, we're pregnant, now we were handing them a baby rattle saying, I'm so sorry to tell you, but your first grandchild on both sides is already with the Lord. Have you ever been there before? Just a couple of months later, my wife met me at the door one more time and she had this same news. Surprise, we're pregnant. Congratulations, you're going to be a dad. And in that moment on the outside, you would have looked at me and said, man, he's really fired up. He's really, really excited about this new chapter in his life. But can I be honest with you? From the moment that word baby was spoken, the primary emotion that I was feeling was the emotion of worry. I was worried. Anytime that we would talk about the baby, I would worry. Anytime she would have a pain, I would worry. 
When it came time to talk about baby names, I would worry. When it came time to go to the doctor, I would worry. When we started talking about things in the future, I would worry. I didn't want to read parenting books. I didn't want to paint a nursery. I didn't want to talk about the pregnancy at all. Because somewhere in the back of my mind, I was convinced that this wasn't going to work out. And I didn't want to get too excited about something. I didn't want to get too attached to something that in the end was just going to disappoint us and hurt us again. Have you ever been there before? I was a prisoner of my own worries. And because of the worry that overcame me, because of the worry that imprisoned me, I was incapable of experiencing joy in one of the most joyous seasons of my entire life. My worry robbed me of that. And as we begin this morning, may I just say that, that that it's exactly what worry does in our life. Worry will rob you. It will rob you of God's best for your life. It'll rob you of the abundant life that God calls you to live. Worry is a cage that will prevent you from being maximized in your life with Jesus. And that's exactly what we're talking about as we walk through this series. So let me just ask you the question and be honest. Do you worry? Yes or no? Do you worry? But let me ask you another question. Has your worry ever done you any good? Because mine hasn't. I'm just going to be honest with you today. Mine has not. Someone once said that worry is like a treadmill. It's something that wears you out and it takes you absolutely nowhere, right? And that's exactly what worry does in our life. It it paralyzes us. It freezes us and it prevents us from walking in true freedom as we pursue Jesus in our life. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7.32, I want you to be without concerns, Jesus echoes that in Matthew 6, 25, says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And yet we hear the word of the Lord, we know what the word says about worry, and all of us seem to worry about this or that. The ignorant worry because they don't know enough. The intellectual worries because they know too much. Those who are poor worry about making money. Those who are rich worry about losing the money they have. Those who are old worry about facing death, and those who are young worry about facing the future. Worry is something that affects all of us, no matter where you're from or what you do, or if you know the Lord or not. So the question is, what do we do about this thing called worry? And how do we worry? What do we worry about? Julius Caesar was right when he said, as a rule, men worry more about what they can't see than what they can see. After doing a little research, I figured out what most of us primarily worry about. Here are the things that make the list. Weight and appearance make the list. You worry about your family, you worry about money, you worry about job stability and employment, car troubles and traffic, death and disease, we worry about our health. And the crazy thing is, experts will tell us that 40% of the things we worry about never happen. 30% of the things we worry about cannot change. And 12% of the things we worry about are needless health concerns. So basically, when you look at the facts about worry, 50% of the things we worry about are not going to happen. And the other 50% of the things we worry about are going to happen anyways. So the question is, why worry? If we're taking notes today, I want you to jot this down. It says, when we worry, we choose to forfeit peace in our life. I want you to understand that it's a, it's a transaction. When you choose to worry, what you're doing is forfeiting the peace that God intends, you, intends for you to have. I can pinpoint many different times in my life when I was overcome with worry. The one I just mentioned was just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm sure you can give me a list of things, list of times in your life when you're overcome with worry. And just as a way of testimony, I can tell you without hesitation that in neither of those ways or in any of those ways, I was never worried and filled with peace in my life. There's never been a moment in my life when I was overcome with worry and also overcome with peace. That's exactly what Paul's going to talk about here in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. 
I want to read that beginning in verse 6. He said, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, it gets pretty interesting when you start to break down what this verse is actually saying. In verse, cha- in verse 6, Paul says, don't worry about anything. Now, if you write in your Bible, I want you to circle that word anything. He said, don't worry about anything. Now, that word worry or that word to be anxious in some translations, it can mean a lot of different things in the English language. But when you look that word up in the original language, in the Greek, it's the word marinate. Marinate, and it literally means to pull in different directions. That word worry, it means to literally rip something apart at the seams. And I just believe that's a perfect word picture for what worry does in my life and in your life. It will, it will tear you apart. It's the same thing that James is referring to in James chapter 1, verse 8, when he talked about being double-minded and unstable in all your ways. See, the Bible teaches that when you're double-minded, you become divided. You become divided emotionally. You become divided mentally. You become divided even spiritually. And the Bible says that when you're double-minded, you're not only divided, but you become unstable in all your ways. Have you ever been unstable? It's hard to get to your destination if you cannot walk with stability. And so don't miss what this is saying. He's saying worry produces unstable people unstable people in all our ways. In fact, the Bible says that worry is just another step towards depression. Did you realize that? The Bible says that in Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. It's no wonder that worry is connected to 51 known diseases today. Dr. Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic once said, worry affects the circulation the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system, and profoundly affects the health. He said, I've never known a man who died from overwork, but many who died from doubt. Listen, worry is a killer. But not only is worry a killer, secondly, I want you to see worry is a sin against God. When we worry, and many of us do, we are actually sinning against God. It's not just a divider of the mind. It's a sin against the one who created that mind. And the reason it's sinful is because when we worry, we are basically calling God a liar. When you worry, you call God a liar. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. You know what worry says to Romans 8, 28? It says, not true. That's a lie. That is incorrect. When we worry, we look God in the face and we say, God, you tell me that all things work together for good, but God, in this moment, I don't believe that you are big enough to be God in this circumstance. I don't believe that you can work things out. I don't believe that you are capable of taking this one on. In fact, I believe I have a better solution than you do. And so worry looks God in the face and calls God a liar. See, when we worry, we place ourselves in a cage, a cage that we have no business being in. And it's a cage that prevents us from walking in true freedom in Jesus Christ. And it affects us physically, it affects us mentally, it affects us spiritually. It affects us in every case of the word. And the Bible said it's a cage that will ultimately lead us to destruction. So the question is, what's the plan? What is the strategy for getting me out of this cage that holds me back? Look back at the word. Verse 6 says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So so he's just going to put the answer out there, okay? He just put it out there, and this is what he said. He said, the way to escape the cage of worry in your life is this, pray about everything. That's it. That's the answer. To summarize it a little differently is this, worry about nothing Pray about everything. Will you say that with me out loud? Let's say that. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Let's say it one more time. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. 
Now, some of us hear that and we're like, surely Paul didn't mean anything, right? Go back to that scripture real quick. So certainly he didn't mean don't pray about anything. Certainly he wasn't saying that we should be worried about nothing because a lot of us have some things in our life that are naturally pretty worrisome. So certainly Paul was a little bit wrong when he said we're not to pray or we're not to worry about anything. See, some of us, we have some major health concerns in this place today. There are some of us, we have family members on the brink of death as we sit here and worship. There are some of us that have friends and loved ones that are far from God, running away from God, things that are naturally thing, worrisome things in our life. Certainly, Paul wasn't saying, don't worry about these things, don't worry about these people. Certainly, he wasn't saying, just wear some rose-colored glasses and, and, and don't worry about the reality of the people and the problems around you. Let me ask you this way. Does God really expect us to worry about nothing? Can I answer it? Yeah. That's exactly what he expects from us. You see, Paul, he knew that we would have problems. You get that, right? Paul knew that we would have issues. He knew our relationships would be jacked up. He knew that we would have family members that are far from God. He knew the result of sin in our world. He knew all of that stuff. You know why? Because he dealt with it himself. And what he tells us is this. The Lord expects you to worry about none of it. That's God's expectation for our life. He said, you don't have to worry about it. You have the ability to worry about nothing because you have the ability to pray about everything. And you know why he said that? Because Paul knew that you can't do both. You can't, you can't give your burdens to the Lord and keep those burdens for yourself. It's gonna be one or the other. You can't give your worries to God and keep those worries for yourself. It's going to be one or the other. Either he's going to be God or you're going to be God. Either he's going to be Lord or you're going to be Lord. Either you're going to trust him or you're going to trust yourself. And Paul knew you can't do both. So what's your decision going to be? He said you can worry about nothing because you can pray about everything. And you have a God that is waiting, waiting to hear your hearts cry. The way to worry about nothing is to pray about everything. My dad used to say, prayer moves the hand that moves the world. And as you think about that, you think about this God of the universe that listens to us and is present in our lives and he responds to our petitions. And, and when you stop to consider the bigness of who God is and the reality of God's presence, I believe it ought to give us a desire in our heart to talk to him. Why don't we talk to him? You think that's something that, that God put on your heart to ignore the Lord? No, listen, it's something that the devil, he, he, he brings us to a place where we want nothing to do with prayer because he understands the power of prayer. Luke 18.1 says that we need to pray always and not give up. That's the Lord saying once again, we should worry about nothing and we should choose to pray about everything. And in fact, Paul goes on to say, when we do pray, we ought to pray with thanksgiving, presenting our request to God. I don't know about you, but when I'm prone to worry, I am not naturally prone to be rejoicing. When I've got something in my life that I'm naturally worrisome about, that's not the moment where I'm just naturally giddy with excitement and gratitude. When you get the bad report, sometimes it's hard to praise. When you get that bad news, sometimes it's hard to put your hands in the sky and say, Lord, I trust you in this moment. But that's exactly what he's telling us to do. And he reminds us that we can rejoice today. First of all, because if we're in Christ, we know that we're not dealing with this situation alone. But we serve a God who said in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you or abandon you. But secondly, he reminds us that we can rejoice because whatever we're dealing with, we can have certainty right now that we are dealing with this by divine permission. We know that if we're a child of the king, that nothing can get to us unless it first goes through him. Therefore, if God is allowing us to walk through a bad season, if he's allowing something bad to happen in our life, it's by divine permission. And ultimately, God says he can use even this for our good and for his glory. 
That's what he says in Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, they work together for the good of those who love God. We either believe it or we don't. But since God is with us, and we believe that God can use even the trials in our life for the glory of God and to better ourselves, he tells us we can rejoice in the Lord no matter what. We can praise our way through our circumstances. So let's keep going. Verse six, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now look at verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God will guard you. When I was a little kid growing up in Texas, during the summers we would have BB gun wars. And I am not recommending this. This is way before paintball and airsoft, but we used to get those pump BB guns and we used to wear each other out. It was crazy. In fact, it hurt really bad. My brother, to this day, has a BB lodged in his skull. Like, he's, don't do this at home. <laughs> but we used to do it, and, and what we used to do is, we used to feel the pain, and we would go in our house, and we would get padded up as much as possible. I, I can remember wearing this long, padded winter coat that went down to my knees. It belonged to my mom, had a little bit of fur around the neck. <laughs> but I wasn't even scared. Listen, I didn't want to get hit with those BBs, so I would do whatever it took to make sure everything was protected. And so I'd go out there in a fur coat, 100 degrees outside. I'm like, man, this is going to hurt. And I can remember being very, very scared, worried that I was going to get shot. Even with that, that protective gear on, if you get shot, it hurts. In fact, one time I got, I got shot right here in the back of the head. So I decided that I was going to find me some good protective headgear. My dad used to have a motorcycle, and so I, I took, without permission, his motorcycle helmet which had a clear shield that I'm pretty sure was shatterproof, all right? And so I put this helmet on, I'm wearing this fur coat, and I go into battle, cul-de-sac wars, and I've got a whole new level of confidence. You know what I'm talking about? Because now, I mean, I'm walking, when I used to be worried about getting shot in the head, now I'm walking in confidence. I'm like, shoot me! I'm protected! So I had a whole new level of confidence. It was pretty, pretty amazing how in an instant, once I put that helmet on, I got to trade in my worry for peace. I got to trade in my worry for a whole new level of confidence. And that's what God's word tells us that we can do. He tells us that when we trade in our worry and we give it to God, that he gives us a whole new kind of peace. And he said that peace is something that is going to guard our hearts and it's going to guard our minds in Christ Jesus. It guards us. Look at verse seven. It says, and the peace of God. Do you see that word peace? That's the, that's the word irna, E-I-R-H-N-A, and it literally means, check this out, to join together. That word peace, it literally means to bring together, to sew back together. So look at the word picture here. You've got the word worry, which literally means to rip apart, to rip apart at the seams. And now you have the word peace, which literally means to put back together, to sew back together. So in verse six, it starts with anxiety and worry. And one verse later in verse seven, it brings you to peace. And there's one thing in between those two things. You know what it is? It's prayer. It's prayer. It's a picture of the great exchange. And God says you can trade in your worry for peace today and it comes through prayer. It's the formula for escaping the cage of worry. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says, You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. Verse 4 says, trusting in, Trust in the Lord forever, because in the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. Psalm 55 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. So before we leave, I want you to get this today. The way to worry less is to pray more. Amen. Sounds so simple, and yet it is so powerful. The way to worry less is to pray more. Something else I want you to get is that his peace is our defense against worry. The peace of God is the helmet in the midst of the battle. Now, the third thing I want you to see is the way to know the peace of God is to first have peace with God. 
If you want to have the peace of God in your life, the Bible says you need to have peace with God. You say, how can I have the peace with God? Check it out. Romans 5.1. Romans 5.1 says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the question I have for you as we conclude this message is this. Do you have the peace of God today? Do you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ today? And if you do, are you willing to trade in your worry for peace? Are you willing to worry about nothing and pray about everything? Are you willing to trust the Lord today?